Hello, Catherine. Nice to see you. Good morning. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in, um, in Nicaragua, in Granada. And what are you doing there? Um, I'm doing an evaluation for um, Oxfam Canada on their Engendering Change program, which is um, a program to support um, transformational women's rights and gender equity work um, in Central America and Africa and, um, and some countries in South Asia. Catherine, you have a long history of doing development work, doing also media justice and media reform work. And uh, you're also an evaluator of that kind of work. And you're one of the only experts in the field who have actually um, studied and evaluated scholar-activist collaboration. Can you tell us a little bit of how that came about? Uh, why did you get interested in looking at scholars and activists working together? Um, I started out, I ran, uh, I was a co-director of an organization called the Center for International Media Action, and um, we were focused on bringing together different sectors and actors and players in that were uh, concerned with um, building the communication rights and media justice field, and through that, um, I had the opportunity to um, work on a program with the Social Science Research Council that was funded by the Ford Foundation to bring together um, activists and scholars. And um, through that experience, and I think just my work um, trying to uh, support this field, um, I realized the need for the resources and expertise and knowledge that's produced within academia to make its way into the hands of people, practitioners, of people that are actually doing the work to make change. And so that has been um, a common thread of my work and still is around how to take knowledge that's being produced and make sure it gets into the hands of those that really need it, that are actually on the forefront of making change um, in various contexts around the world. Yeah, I remember you talking about it, and then then a couple of people have wrote wrote, wrote about written about it ever since. How um, very often when we talk about media reform and media justice movements, those who sort of views and discourses and power we want to uh, counter, mm -hmm. those have money and resources and access to data and access to information, and. Nowadays, I suppose all of us have uh, easier access to big data through um, our digital uh, communications. But mm -hmm. can can we analyze data and how to use use data and how to use information? That's also a big question. Well, yeah, I think I think one of the main issues is, as you said, I mean, there's there's a lot of of money behind research, um, particularly research that is more aligned with corporate interests. Let's, you know, that's realistically what's happening. Um, so I think that's one issue. And another is um, what you bring up is that m groups that are working on the ground, activists and groups working in NGOs and non in the civil sector, civil society, they don't often have the time to engage. They don't have a access to the information. Certainly if you sat them in a room and gave them a week, they could make their way through research and pull out what they needed, but that they often don't have that luxury of time. Um, so they really need to be able to um, have easy access to the information and have it provided to them in a way that's and packaged for them in a way that they can then take that and, and use it in the, for whatever for whatever reasons they or other, uh, however is going to advance their agenda. Uh, but how do we as scholars, and I'll say we, uh, um, you know, that our, our course and, and so we are trained to think we need to take a stance uh, that is distant from whatever we study and we need to remain somewhat objective and, um, you know, perhaps we can criticize capitalist uh, uh, cultures and corporate media, but we are not really um, never taught how to be advocates, and actually I don't even think that that's something that is considered uh, desirable or even proper for a scholar. Um, do you think that's correct, or how do we reconcile that kind of philosophy? Well, I think that whole, I mean, it's, 
it's the same that the this pretense of objectivity is the same for academia as for journalism. I don't really think it's there's always interest involved, and you're dealing with human beings, and so we always have our particular um, perspectives and point of view which we bring to the research we 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 conduct. It's inevitable, um, but I also think that the same objectivity uh, with which academics academics will bring to critiquing something they can also bring to supporting something. So if they see something that they feel is um, is effective, then they can bring that same ob objective lens um, to that effectiveness and to into highlighting that effectiveness. Um, and to so it's not necessarily advocating because I have a personal belief or or I'm politically aligned with a particular interest or project, but actually um, I'm interested in the theme and this is something given um, the framework I'm working with that is actually works. And so I want to highlight this. So I think it's, it's just a little bit, uh, just a matter of sort of shifting how we're thinking, how academics or researchers are thinking about, um, about the role they're playing. Well, yeah, that sounds wonderful. And it's always wonderful um, to be able to help and to be able to collaborate. But what do you think, if we scholars look at this sort of uh, uh, very selfishly, what can we gain? by being advocates? Well, I think, well, there's two things. I mean, first of all, I think, um, I would say as a human being, um, our lives are richer and have more meaning if we are able to support something beyond our own self-interest to start. Um, second, I think there's there's been a lot of research showing that researchers that are more engaged with work on the ground um, are better researchers. They have better quality work. So even thinking in purely self-interested terms, those researchers which do um, either adopt a more collaborative approach, um, for whatever that means, and are engaging with work that's happening on the ground are simply going to be better at what they do. I love that. That that's really encouraging. Um, then, couple. No, seriously. Um, what do you think are are some things that, let's say, I as a scholar want to now engage with a, let's say, media justice group or uh, you know, media reform uh, organization lobbying for some ownership rules or whatever? Uh, what are some things that I as a scholar should be? aware of or prepared for uh, when starting some, um, like, real collaboration? Mm -hmm. So a couple things. I mean, I think it's really important that scholars, I mean, or I, mean, I see myself as an evaluator, it's the same, is that um, your knowledge is not superior to knowledge of people doing the work or the practitioners or the, the people you're working with. Um, they may not have a PhD but they, their knowledge is legitimate and it's been obtained through years of, of, of practice. So it's important to legitimize that um, and, and have uh, come into the relationship with, with respect for that. Um, I also think it's important to, to recognize the timelines um, that a lot of these groups are working with, the timelines, um, the different priorities. The, their priorities are not getting your dissertation done or getting a piece of the priorities are, are moving forward a particular agenda. So it's really thinking about how you can make yourself useful, how you can build a relationship with this group so that it's not just you going in and taking from them, which is often the case, um, but actually producing something with them that will be useful for them. Uh, some examples, sometimes they're things that are very concrete. Um, so perhaps helping them with fundraising proposals, that's a big thing. Um, helping them with evaluation. Um, helping them taking your research and repackaging it in a way that they can use easily, putting together a two-page um, piece in PDF format that they can circulate. Those are just some ways that um, I know academics in the past have worked successfully with some of these groups. That's wonderful, both sort of big things and concrete small things. Because as mm -hmm. you said b exactly. before, um, these groups are, the resources are so scarce often that... Uh, so scarce. Yeah, yeah. Um, Catherine Borg... And increasingly so. Increasingly so, right? Mm -hmm. um, Catherine Borgman, our thank you so much. Uh, 
below this video will be also a link to Catherine's blog uh, that she did for another related course a couple of years ago, which is still very, very current and important and valid. Um, can we be in touch uh, via email or in this blog if we have any further questions? Absolutely. Catherine, thank you so much. And uh, Thank you, Mina. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.